Hi YouTube, welcome to my YouTube channel. Uh, my name is Tyler and we're gonna do a little bit of a reading vlog today. So I have 125 pages left in cast and honestly I'm just ready to finish it. So I'm gonna plow through it today um, and I'm gonna take it take you along with me um, and kind of share my thoughts and feelings about this book. Um, so let's get to it. I'm actually gonna read over there at that desk instead of on my sofa because Gus is being good and sleeping for once and so I won't disturb him and hopefully Tiger Cat won't disturb him either. Tiger Cat. Yeah, what is your issue today? Sir, interesting. Okay, do you want to read with me? I am currently in chapter 19. You want to come? He's distracting me.
I just got a phone call and now I got a voicemail. I'm just like, I want to read. Let me read. The dog is barking. Okay, I'm gonna take a break. <clears throat> okay, so I read a little more uh, off camera. The dog stopped barking and so I realized I only had three pages left in that chapter. And then the next chapter was also like two and a half pages. So I read that. And this chapter, this short chapter I read really kind of highlights some of the issues I'm having with this book. This book feels so disjointed to me. It feels like just a collection of anecdotes with very little like connection between them. Like I'm just supposed to know what's getting put across. But like, so this two and a half page chapter is called the German girl with dark wavy hair. And it's about a girl in Germany during 19 or during World War II and how she has dark wavy hair and she, the, how people are giving her side looks. They're like, hmm, is she actually Aryan? And her whole family like goes back generations to make sure there's no unclean blood. But it's just that story. There's literally no connection to anything that was just talked about. So the chapter before that is about the narcissism of caste and how people, even if they're not like narcissistic about themselves specifically, they, um, if they're of the dominant caste, they think highly of themselves and are trying to protect that caste. Um, so how does that connect to this next story? Why was this story about this girl, German girl with dark wavy hair a separate chapter? I, <laughs> and how does it connect to the chapter before it? Or the, maybe it's gonna connect to the chapter after. The Stockholm Syndrome and the, survivor of this, the survival of the subordinate cast. That doesn't sound like it's gonna connect to this German girl. So why was this story told in a separate chapter? There isn't even really any connecting to the cast. Like, there's no comments about that. It's just literally, this. she has dark wavy hair. And so she started measuring her eyes and measuring features of her face to make sure that she, she still fit uh, German standards. Um, and her family, like I said, did this genealogical work and they like kept this information in case anyone ever questioned her. So I get that there is this tension even within the dominant cast to make sure that you're safe, if that makes sense. Um, but like it doesn't talk about that specifically in this. I'm just like supposed to understand the point of this story, but I don't understand the point of this story besides... I don't understand the point of this story within this part of the book. Why is it a separate? I don't understand why it's a separate chapter. I, 
I don't get it. This is really the problem I'm having with this book. It just feels so disjointed to me. So disjointed. And so st story-based, but it's not following any particular people. Um, it's like just lots of anecdotes and lots of stories. And I just, I don't know. I don't know. I really want to go read on the sofa. Um, I have less than 100 pages left in the book, but, well, is it gonna, Gus is still on the sofa. He is by far our most rambunctious and wild cat. So like, I don't want to disturb him while he is being calm, but I really want to sit over there. <laughs> Anyways, I'm about to start my third 15 minute reading sprint in this book. Um, so, I'm gonna do that. It is two o'clock. Um, I'm gonna start my fifth reading sprint here shortly. Um, I have 60 pages left. Um, I don't know if I'm actually gonna finish this or not um, because I'm starting to struggle. Uh, also, the cat is still on the sofa, uh, which is also making this a little bit of a struggle because I want to stretch out on the couch and read in a comfortable position. And instead I'm in a office chair reading at a desk, which is not very conducive to me wanting to keep reading this. Uh, this cat has been there since like 1130 this morning. Go do something, sir. Uh, we have a whole catio for you. Go outside, watch some birds. I've been seeing all sorts of birds in the yard. Anyways, I guess I should read. Um, I don't think I'm going to do any there might be a short clip of me reading from earlier, but I don't think I'm going to do any sped up clips of me reading just because I don't have a place to prop up the camera that isn't like directly in my face. Uh, again, like I said, I was planning on reading on the sofa and there was a place to put the camera. Um, anyways, blame Gus for this being a very boring vlog. Okay, so I read some more and I have to say I really enjoyed the section, what is the section called? Part six, Backlash. So this section started off with the election of Barack Obama and then goes into the election of Donald Trump. And I found those chapters to be pretty interesting um, because those are the things I'm interested in. I while reading it, I'm like, this feels very like out of place with the rest of the book. Like the introduction kind of started with giving me an overview of Donald Trump's election um, and his term in office, uh, but hasn't really been revisited much through the book. Like it's not a book about uh, presidential politics or really politics at large, um, but I did find those two chapters about presidential politics to be interesting because those are things I'm interested in. Uh, but the chapter that really stood out in this section was the chapter 27 titled The Symbols of Caste. And so this chapter is about um, really comparing the Confederacy to uh, Nazi Germany. Uh, so it talks a lot about the removing of Confederate soldiers, uh, not Confederate soldiers, Confederate statues uh, that has been happening in the last, I don't know, five, six years. Um, in the backlash to that specifically. Uh, but the end of this chapter really, really was something quite special. Uh, it talked about and described the, stat uh, the memorials in Berlin and in Germany to Holocaust victims. Um, and this comes after 
she talks about all of the um, aggressive backlash to removing Confederate statues across the United States. And it goes into talking about these memorials to Jewish victims in the Holocaust, as well as other victims. Um, there are these things called stumbling stones that are throughout Europe that has the name of the person who died um, at the hands of Nazis uh, in concentration camps, etc. Um, and she has one here. Uh, they're embedded among the cobblestones in front of houses and apartment buildings where the victims whose names are inscribed on them and are known to have last lived before being abducted by the Gestapo. Here lived Hildra, oh God, sorry, I am gonna butcher this. Hildegard Blumenthal, born 1897, deported 1943, died at Auschwitz. Um, and it's just, even just like small memories uh, memorials to victims and but then there are also big memorials she talks about one at a train station I believe um, that like it's the first thing you see and it's about don't forget about these <laughs> terrible places I think it was naming the places of um, naming major concentration camps I think it was sorry I, I <laughs> haven't con con got all my thoughts together. Um, but then she also talks about, she compares how uh, high level Nazis uh, fared after World War II. So, you know, Hitler killed himself, his wife killed herself. Um, whereas, oh, this, this, wow, this hit me. In America, the men who mounted a bloody war against the United States to keep the right to enslaved humans for generations went on to live out their retirement in comfort. Confederate President Jefferson Davis went on to write his memoirs at a plantation in Mississippi that is now the site of his presidential library. Why does the why does Jefferson Davis have a presidential library to begin with? Anyways, Robert E. Lee became an esteemed college president. When they died, they were both granted state funerals with military honors and were revered with statues and monuments. Like, that's such a different thing. And at some other point, she also mentions how um, plantation owners were the people who received reparations after the Civil War. They were the ones that were given money uh, basically to pay them for the property that they lost in this war. Uh, wow. Um, and then it talks about how people will ask how do Germans honor Nazis? And they're like, we don't. <laughs> um, and so this whole this whole chapter just really, 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 wow, it is a uh, really strong, important, powerful chapter. Um, in Germany, restitution has rightly been paid and continues to be paid to survivors in the Holocaust. In America, it was the slaveholders who got restitution and not the people whose lives and wages were stolen for them for 12 generations. Those who instilled terror on the lowest caste over the following century after the former, formal end of slavery, those who tortured and killed humans before thousands of onlookers and who aided and abetted those lynchings, or who looked the other way well into the 20th century, not only went free, but rose to become leading figures, Southern governors, senators, sheriffs, businessmen, mayors. Um, it just really powerful and really kind of highlights that America has not taken the steps to grapple with uh, its biggest sin, uh, you know, the original sin, slavery. We have not taken the steps to um, really grapple with what it means that this country was founded on and birthed on, through owning other people. Uh, and instead of doing the hard work after the Civil War, um, Instead, we try to protect 
white slaveholders. Um, we tried to protect their fragile-ness uh, instead of doing what we should have and uh, make things right for former slaves. Like, wow. Anyways, that chapter just really, really hit me. Um, so I'm glad I didn't DNF the book because I think that chapter is incredibly profound. Um, and then the rest of this chat, this part uh, talks about, uh, yeah, talks kind of about how the, um, the ingrainedness of this caste system in America has made America a very broken, is the word I want to use, broken country in so much that we are not willing to help other people through fear of uh, helping the lower, the lower caste. Um, so we don't have universal health care. We don't have... Um, a strong social welfare security net. Uh, and that comes from this, this caste system uh, that we can't let go of, or we choose not to let go, go of. Uh, yeah, a uh, really, really, really strong chapter or section part <laughs> there um yeah wow okay i have uh like let's see i'm on page 370 and it ends at 388 so that's like 18 pages uh so i'm gonna finish this up and give my last thoughts on this book hi i have finished cast and I actually just finished recording a whole clip talking about it and then I turned my camera off instead of pressing stop record button so I have to redo this all over again which is great because I was already stumbling and struggling over my thoughts and feelings about this book um so I think I talked about in another clip um my biggest struggle with this book was it just felt very anecdotal to me. It was just a lot of stories. Um, but in a way that was different than Warmth of Other Suns. Warmth of Other Suns is also a book based on personal stories, but we were following four people basically through their entire lives and then using their stories as a jumping off point um, to get into the larger narrative of the Great Migration in America and using their stories to kind of uh, highlight um, aspects of the Great Migration. Whereas this, I felt like the stories were used as evidence of the caste system, I suppose. Um, but we weren't following any particular person or people through this. Um, some of the anecdotes and stories were like news articles um, or news stories about um, racial uh, tensions that had gotten to the news through various things. Uh, sorry, I can't, my mind is completely blanking. Uh, Sometimes it's like stories of actual people, either famous or maybe just like people she knows personally. Um, because some were just very vague, like a black man and a white woman or something like that. Uh, and I think that was part of the issue. It felt very um, surface level to me. Uh, I, I wasn't getting like the real strong facts and figures that I was anticipating or expecting. And I didn't feel like I, I went into this book expecting like an argument that America is a caste system. And that's not really what this book is. I don't feel like it's putting forward that argument, at least not in a very clear way necessarily. Um, and I don't mean that like 
the argument is muddled in the book. I don't think that's necessarily what the book is trying to do. Um, and I spent a lot of time with this book while reading being like, I don't know if I think this caste system is different than racism in America. By the end of the book, I think I've come to the conclusion that the way that racism and prejudice is so built in and baked into the American system and society is what makes it a caste system. But I don't even know if that's what she was trying to say or actually what she believes. That's kind of what I ended the book thinking. Um, but I, I don't know. <laughs> um, I don't know if that's what she was trying to say or do with this. Um, I felt like I was also missing the Indian caste system piece from this book um, because Nazi Germany, Confederate, Jim Crow South, and Indian, the Indian caste system are kind of these three things that she is comparing to highlight the similarities. And while the Nazi and Jim Crow ones felt very fleshed out to me and the comparisons um, seemed very clear to me um, by virtue of maybe just being more familiar with both of those um, things in general, uh, the Indian caste system piece didn't feel as fleshed out to me. I felt like maybe that should have been used as a thread throughout the whole book to show because the Indian caste system is the oldest. Um, and the title of this is The Origin of Our Discontents. So if the origin of our discontents is this caste system, um, I felt like it would have been useful to, con not constantly, but to compare our current systems to this Indian system that is so old and how it had, to kind of make that argument that America is a caste system, I suppose. Um, whereas the Indian pieces felt a lot more informal to me. It was typically like a story of a person she met at a conference. Um, and it wasn't necess it wasn't very historic. I don't, I won't say there were no historic section, uh, there was no historic information about the Indian caste system, but, uh, there was just less of it. Uh, and I, I wanted some more of that, I think, and that might have made this a stronger book for me. Um, yeah, I, I, I can't remember all of what I said in my other review, and honestly, my other review was kind of a mess. Um, but I kind of think those were kind of like my biggest issues. It just felt very surface level to me. Um, but there were parts that I did enjoy. I felt like I learned things in certain parts. Um, that section about the election of Barack Obama, Donald Trump, as well as um, comparing America's, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? My words have just completely emptied my head. Uh, America's reckoning with the Confederacy compared to Germany's reckoning with the Nazis were very strong. And that was what I was expecting more of this book to be because that was a lot more um, fact-based, history-based. Uh, I was expecting more of a historic tome, not tome, tone. <laughs> Uh, I was expecting more of that from this book, and that that's not necessarily what I got. Um, and it just felt very disjointed to me. Like, parts of it, like, I don't know why some chapters came when they did. Uh, I didn't understand the, like, organization of this. Um, because it wasn't told in, like, historic order either. Um, I don't know. <laughs> so I'm going to give it three stars. I know it's very highly rated on Goodreads, so I'm willing to admit that I maybe missed something. Uh, it's very possible I missed something, uh, especially because I read this over a very long period of time. So maybe I read something in chapter five, and then by the time I picked the book up again in 
two weeks, uh, I had forgotten something from chapter five, and maybe that was the important piece I needed to really unlock this book for myself. Um, you know, so I think I've touched on all the big things. <laughs> It just wasn't the book I, I expected when I picked it up and it wasn't, I don't think it necessarily was making the argument that I expected. Um, so there's that. I'm gonna remember to actually press the stop record button before turning my camera off. Um, I'll see y'all next week. Uh, yeah, bye. Before I go, Gus is still in my spot. It is four o'clock. He has been here for at least four and a half hours. Never moved once for me to lay in the couch spot that I wanted to lay in. Anyways, goodbye. I'll see y'all next week.